when I was a young pastor uh, in California planting a church, uh, I've told you I started with 19 people, met in a school, uh, trying to get the critical mass going. It was, it was a challenge, and it was uh, very difficult at times, but a lot of fun. Uh, and when I first began, there was a, a man in my church. I had, it was more of a blue-collar church. This was more of a white-collar church. And, and so I had a lot of farmers in the church. And uh, they, you know, they were, they, they farmed sugar beets or the thing, whatever they farmed usually wound up at my house because they would bring me things, uh, asparagus or uh, artichokes and things like that. Uh, well, th- this one farmer in my church, uh, his name was Jess. I, di- I didn't know what he farmed exactly, but when I was a new pastor, 31 years old, I'm in my office one day and farmers, they, I don't know, they get up like at three in the morning to do whatever it is they do. Uh, and so he was out, you know, doing his thing. I, when I got to church, like at eight o'clock, he showed up unannounced and just wanted to meet with the pastor and just talk. I'm like, great, doors open, you know, and he came in. Uh, he has overalls and they were very dirty and his shoes were caked in like mud. Uh, and he's walking across my new carpeting and I'm like, oh, great, you know, I love the sheep, but uh, yeah, I've got limitations, but uh, come on in. And he came in, sat down in a chair and uh, crossed his leg and, and I see his boots covered all around the perimeter, caked with mud and straw looking stuff. And I'm like, wow. And uh, so we were just talking, you know, shooting the breeze and getting to know each other. And I noticed when I was sitting there, there was this really foul odor. And I was like, something smells really bad. And it wasn't here before he got here. So I'm making a one-to-one, you know, I'm, I'm doing the observations thinking it has to be him. You know, so what do you do in a situation like that? I, I was getting to where I almost couldn't even breathe. It was so bad. I mean, do you say something? Do you say, hey, do you smell something? Uh, but I didn't want to, you know, I was a new pastor, a young guy. I want to build the church. I don't want to drive anybody away by saying anything. So I just kind of just went with it. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh man, I don't know what he kind of farmer he is, but it is so foul. It's unbelievable. Um, then, then he told me he was a pig farmer. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because I don't think a sugar beet farmer would smell like this. And I think you have part of the pig sty on your boots that are now in my office. It was unbelievable. Try being a pastor, you know? And, uh, and, and, and so <laughs> it was, became very apparent to me, even after he left, that the entire time he was sitting there, he had no clue there was an odor. He didn't know it. It's the world he lived in. He just happened to drop by my church to just talk to me, you know, uh, and he, he couldn't smell it. And it, it, that's the way it is with a really foul odor, isn't it? Because if you're in it so long, what happens? Well, you grow accustomed to it and you don't even smell it. And what has that got to do with theology? Everything. I'm serious. It has everything to do with theology. Like, like in what way? Well, in this way, when you don't know Christ, you have the stench of death about you. I know that's true. Because that's taught all through, it's all throughout Romans. It's in Paul's letters. Very clear that when we don't know Christ, we're spiritually dead. We are. And death has an odor about it, a spiritual death. And you, you can you kind of see the odor when you watch how a person performs in life. You can just see that they don't know God by the decisions they make, how they treat people, how they look at the world. You can just see death is about them. So it has like a stench about it. But the gospel of Christ that Paul's been talking about in Romans chapter 1 has a fragrance about it. Because it's, it's, it's a beautiful fragrance because it takes somebody who's dead and has a stench of spiritual death about them, redeems them, and, and makes them have a life of fragrance. You have two choices. You, you come into the world this way, and you may not realize that it has a stench about it, but when God talks to you and taps on your shoulder and tells you, no, you, you're a sinner who needs my gospel, the day you switch and embrace that Christ, there's a fragrance about your life that will blow everybody in your life away. See, Paul's been uh, talking about the power of the gospel and the reasons why you'd want to share the power of the gospel to those who have the stench of death about them. And today we're going to look at the fourth reason why you would want to share the gospel. And notice how he presents it. Just ask yourself, positive presentation, negative presentation. What does he say? For the wrath of God concerning this gospel is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We'll get to that last clause next week because it's going to talk about how all non-believers who have the stench of death about them are born with the reality of God in their life. They know it. And so when they argue against it, they're arguing against the reason that God put into their own soul. But that's next week. We want to just focus on the wrath of God. Positive, negative message. What would you say? Negative. So if I were to take our, our marquee out there that, that has the title of this series out there, The Road of the Righteous, and I pulled it off this week and said, this Sunday we're talking about the wrath of God. Majority of the cars driving by there are going to be thinking what? 
Uh, keep going, honey. Don't pull in there. Man, an unloving church. Man, it sounds super critical. I mean, legalistic. We're not going there. They're talking about the wrath of God. Is God wrathful? Yeah. Is he loving? Yeah. He's a perfect balance between these things. And so Paul says, hey, I've been telling you about the wonder of the, of the gospel of Christ, verses 16 and 17. Uh, that's the positive. That's the good news. He says, but I need to share with you the bad news. The bad news is the gospel is there to redeem and save, to take somebody who has the stench of death about them and give them the fragrance of life. But one of the motivations to share this gospel is God's wrath is going to be on that person. Motivation to share is so that there's no wrath on them. Where did Paul get that particular methodology? And some Christians, Christians are really good just about the negative stuff. You know, the hellfire brimstone. Those, I grew up in that kind of environment. You know, you walk out of there just scared to death. And you're a Christian. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? And I grew up like that. I asked my, my mom asked me one time, she said, how do you like the new preacher? I said, does he have to yell and scream at me all the time? I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I grew up like this. Uh, but some Christians love the, love the law, love the wrath, and then some love the grace so much they forget about the wrath. Oh, God is love. He'll accept you any old which way, etc. But there has to be the balance between the two. That's Paul, balance. The gospel's balance. He learned that from Jesus. Notice how Jesus balanced the gospel. You'll see it here, positive, negative. John chapter 5, verse 22. For not even the Father judges anyone. He's given all judgment to the Son. Why? In order that uh, all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, notice the cause effect, belief leads to eternal life instantly. Death, stench of death, leads to life. He, he does not come into judgment, but he's passed out of death into life. The implication is pretty clear. If you do not believe who Jesus is, you reject the crucifixion, you reject, reject the resurrection, what you eject the exist, reject the existence of God. You do not pass from death to life. You're in death. Judgment will come upon you, he says. That's Jesus. So Paul takes his lead from how to share the gospel from the Lord himself, and so should we. It should always be balanced between the, the good news of the gospel, the redemption for sinners from the Savior, and God judges sin. If it's, not, if it's not covered by the blood of Christ. So this is the ultimate um, motivation for sharing the gospel. It's our, it's our fourth motivation. So let's, let's review. What are the reasons for uh, sharing the gospel? Verse 16, Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For then he says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. He's going to give you the four motivations to share the glory of the gospel with your friends who don't know Jesus. Let's review the first three reasons. Reason number one, the gospel is preeminent. That's the first reason in, in verse 16. There's no other gospel like that gospel. It's the only one that can take a dead sinner and redeem them. It's the gospel, the good news. Number two, it's powerful in that it can take a dead sinner and give them spiritual life. There's only one gospel that can do that. And then he says in verse 17, as we talked about last week, the gospel's purifying. It takes a person who's dead and has no righteousness about them. They have false righteousness about them, but they have no true righteousness. And when they come to Christ in faith, he gives them his righteousness. And 1 Corinthians 1.30 is a great proof text uh, for that particular motif. Uh, God gives you his righteousness at the moment of faith. Now he's going to give you reason number four that you should share the gospel with somebody. It's protective. It protects. What's it protect from? What did he say? Go back to verse 18. What did he say it protects you from? Were you, were you here or you just came in? Uh, the wrath of who? God. God. It protects you from the wrath of God. Uh, I have a young friend of mine out in California that um, when uh, he went to a fire training school up in Sacramento, uh, we, we went, Liz and I went to his graduation, and they had all the young guys. Uh, they had a big uh, cement building with multiple uh, floors to it, and, and they did all this cool stuff, repelling and putting out fires to show how good they were uh, as new firemen. And so we went for his graduation ceremony. It was a lot of fun. His name's Joe. Eventually, Joe um, uh, got into uh, becoming a fire jumper. Uh, in the state of California. Now, you realize California burns every year. You realize this. Yes. I've had so many people come up to me, your state's on fire. <laughs> I'm from Virginia. I mean, but, <laughs> but every year it burns. I mean, I lived out there for 50 years. Every year around this, you know, it, the fall, it burns. It just, ha it just happens. So there's, there's a lot of young men who are firemen. Joe was one of them. Uh, and a fire jumper is like on the edge firefighting because you're in a helicopter 
They got a rope. They fly out into the middle of nowhere in the mountains. You propel down on a rope uh, with your team, and you go for it. I mean, the, the flames can be 80 feet high. I mean, they're massive, and they drop you. So that's an awesome job. That's what he was doing. And so I asked him after he got back from his first fire, like, how was it to be dropped in the middle of nowhere with your team and fire everywhere? And he was telling me that, you know, what it was like, and it was cool, saw things you, most people won't see. But uh, I asked him this question. I said, what happens, because I've been in those fires before in California, what happens when the wind changes direction and the fire comes back at you? Then what do you guys do since there's, there's no backup? He goes, oh, we have tents that we jump into. Huh? A tent? Tent, fire, you're gone. He goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. He goes, no, no, no. No, there it's we call them shake and bakes. <laughs> oh. Shake and bake. I'm thinking that's a cooking term. I'm thinking shake and bake, college days, chicken. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not thinking, what in the world is shaking big? Tent? He goes, well, we carry them on our pack, and if we see the fire is switching directions and coming at us and they take out our position, we pop the tents open, we jump inside of them, we zip them closed, the fire goes over us, and then when the fire's gone, we jump out. That sounds like a job I'm doing. <laughs> Talk about bravery. And then it hit me, that is an awesome theological concept. Is, are you having an aha moment? How many are having an aha moment? Excellent. And what was your aha moment? Who's the tent? Who's the tent? Jesus. Yeah. And you jumped inside of it because I believe he's the savior. He died for me. He rose again. He defeated sin and death. He rose the third day victorious. And he said, whoever believes in me, I will grant you life. You, he becomes the tent. You never thought of him this way, did you? But he delivers you from the wrath, the fire that goes over. This is what Paul's talking about. You're either in the tent or not in the tent. I don't know about you, but I'm in the tent, and I'm glad I'm in there. Because the day when his wrath is revealed, it will go over me as I walk into glory. We want to look at the, the concept of wrath, because Paul is going to develop God's wrath in the entire chapter. So I can't explain the rest of the chapter unless we stop and pause and understand what God's wrath means. So we're going to look at three things as we look at the wrath of God. Number one, we're going to define the word wrath. Because he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Okay, so it looks simple enough. Okay, great. Well, the thing is, there's more to it than meets the eye when you look at the, the original text, the Greek text. Because he has two options for the word wrath or anger. When we use the word anger, we have one word about it. Greek has two words about it. So Paul's going to pick an unusual word for wrath that has great theological significance, and we're going to be thankful he didn't pick the other word. So here are the options, and I'll, I'll give them to you. And I transliterated them into English for you uh, to understand the two words. Uh, the word that he uses here for wrath is orge. That's the word for wrath, anger. The other word, I think I have, do we have a slide on this? Okay, see, wrath equals orge. Or wrath equals thumos. These are his choices, lexically in Greek. Now, since the word of God is inspired, it matters greatly which one the Holy Spirit told Paul to pick. Why so? Well, the word orge, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain thumos first. Thumos is like a person who needs anger management. What's their problem? The least little thing does what? Triggers them. They, they got angry for no reason whatsoever. That's never happened to anybody here. No one? No, no, th no thumos. What's thumos? Thumos is something just set me off. And it usually works like this if you're a Christian. You're kind of thinking, well, I'm, and my Christian walk's kind of getting together. I'm doing pretty good. And, I think, and then all of a sudden, somebody cuts you off in traffic, and thumos comes out. <laughs> like a wild animal inside your car. You know what I'm saying? Thumos. <laughs> then you, you, then the, the, the event's over, and you look at yourself, and you think, I, I guess I still have carnality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's that thumos thing. It's like instant anger. I watched it all the time when I played baseball as a kid growing up. And, um, you know, guy would strike out who's super competitive. Instead of walking back to the dugout, what'd he do? He did what? <laughs> through the bat and through the helmet. Bam, bam. I'm, I'm, I've seen guys do it. And I, we've had this discussion. Like every season, the coach would say, You've, hey, if, if you're on the on-deck circle warming up, you know, uh, and so-and-so is at bat, you might not want to stand there. You know, I'm like, can you tell him not to throw that bat? You could take somebody out. So that's thumos, bad anger. That's not the word God has Paul put here. He uses orge. What's that kind of anger? Uh, that is one that takes a long time in coming. Oh, 
It's kind of like, and all analogies break down, but it's kind of like a coal fire. What's like a coal fire? What's a coal fire like? Do you see it? Do you know what I'm talking about? You don't know about coal? Okay, coal fire catches under the ground, and it just burns forever. But, but every once in a while, it pops out of the surface and scorches everything, and then it goes away. That's like orge. Two, and the analogy breaks down because God's anger actually goes away. But, but it's, it takes a long time coming. Now, if God were to pick thumos for his wrath, what would happen? Well, the minute you sin, what happens? Well, she was there a minute ago until that person cut her off in traffic, and then God just vaporized her right there. <laughs> gone. And you probably feel it like that about some of the cars around you, don't you? Yeah, so God, just take them out. Just, you know, this, that, it's wrong. I'm glad that God says, when I have wrath, it's orge. What's that mean? It takes him a long time to get angry. You have a, are you a child with parents? Which, <laughs> I'm just saying, which parent would you rather have? Your dad, who is orge, takes him a long time to get angry, or he's thumos? Maybe your dad is thumos and your mom's orge, but you would want them to both be orge, take a long time to get mad. That's God. That's the, ch- the word that is chosen here. Now, if you want to take the word that's used here, uh, slow to wrath, and find its Hebrew equivalent in the Old Testament. I have a book that does that. Uh, it's a very unusual book. Great book. But the, the, the correspondence in the Old Testament is the word af, A-P-H, af. Uh, here's how that word, and that's the word for orge in the Old Testament. Here's how it's used concerning God. And it means, the word is really interesting. It means in its, in its literal form, it denotes a person who's, whose face is getting red and their nose is turning red with anger. And eventually, they get to the point where the anger comes out and smoke's coming out of their nose, like figuratively speaking. Psalm 18. David, a politician, a king, says... The cords of death encompassed me, and uh, the torrents of the ungodliness terrified me. The cords of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord and cried to the Lord God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him unto his ears. Then what did God do when he heard the sound of his godly man being attacked by godless people? The God just looked down from heaven and go, that's just too bad for you, David. So sorry that your empire's falling apart like that. No, the earth shook and it quaked. The foundations of the mountains were trembling. They were shaken because he, God, was angry or gay. Took him a while to get there. Then smoke went out of his nostrils and fire from his mouth devoured and coals were kindled by it. You, you don't want God getting to that level with you. What was God like today, honey? Smoke. Angry. See, it took him a while to get there. Uh, the book of Nahum is a book of uh, judgment, and it says concerning God, uh, Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, it says, the Lord is what? Slow to what? Anger, but he's great in power. I mean, but then he throws on this one little proviso. He says, uh, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So you might get away with your sin for so long, but then there comes the day where God says, enough, and then he judges. But it takes him a long time to get there. I am glad that that kind of God is the one Paul's talking about in, in Romans 1.18 because that shows us several things about him. He's merciful. He's compassionate. He loves us as he calls us to repent and come to his son. He, he waits for you. He waits. Uh, this, at the golden calf incident in the Old Testament, you see God in action uh, Exodus chapter 32. Uh, remember the scenario? Moses is on the mount for 40 days. He's in the presence of God. It's a spiritual experience for him. Wouldn't it be you're in the presence of God? He's going to give you the Ten Commandments. And while he's up there having this major spiritual experience as the leader of the, of the, of the Israelite nation, what are they doing down below? Well, they're kind of wondering where the octogenarian went. He's been up there for 40 days. I mean, he wasn't on an oxygen tank when he went up there, but something's gone. I mean, does he die up there? I mean, where is he? We need to worship something. So let's take all of our jewelry together and let's form a golden calf and worship that. How'd that go? Well, while they're doing that in the 40-day period, here's what we read in verse 7 to 32. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. That's what sinners do. They, they move away from what God wants and, and get into corruption. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They made a way for themselves. They made a molten calf. They have worshipped it. They've sacrificed to it. And they said, because God heard what they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. No, it wasn't. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are what? Obstinate obstinate, stiff-necked, self-willed people. Now, uh, then God says, let me alone that my what? My anger may burn against them. God says, I got to move in judgment. They've challenged me. 
They've aroused my holiness. They, they've aroused my jealousy. I'm moving in wrath to deal with them. God was angry, but it took him 40 days to get there. See, that's orge. It takes him a while to get there. Paul says, for the wrath of God is revealed. He's telling you it takes time for God to reveal his wrath, but indeed he shall. But he gives you time to come to him in faith. I'm glad he's that way. In the New Testament, we read this about that particular word. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Paul says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you as a non-Christian, he says, what are you doing? What's he say? You are storing up orge, wrath, for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Right now, you can say, hey, my life's going along pretty good. You know, my team's heading to the Super Bowl. My job's good. Things great. You know, I'm loving the weather. Things are wonderful. Great relationship with my wife. You know, I don't, I don't have to worry about the wrath of God. And, and God says, no, one day it's going to come. Because when you reject me and sin, God says, you're making a deposit into the bank of wrath. And one day I close the door on your vault because you just made your last deposit. And then I appear for all people. But it takes a while for God to get there. Uh, Romans chapter 12, Paul says, never take, uh, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the orge, for the wrath of God. For as it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Uh, judgment will come because God takes a while to get to that point, but it will come. Uh, here's another one. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10 says, we as Christians should uh, wait for his son uh, from heaven, Jesus, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from what? The wrath to come. Remember the, the tent? I got into the tent. Who's the tent? Jesus. How did I get in there? By faith, I went in there realizing this could deliver me. This will deliver me. This faith belief. Notice what Jesus says about belief. John 3. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Notice the contrast by the word but. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. It's a perpetual thing. And one day it's consummated when that person doesn't lead a life that follows God uh, by faith then one day God reveals himself and judges that person. Next, we want to look at, uh, the, that's the definition of the word wrath. It takes a while for God to get there, but he gets there. Uh, his wrath is dissected. Let's dissect it. When you read through the Old Testament, and I have two degrees in the Old Testament, so I know something about the Old Testament, but as I've read through the Old Testament many times, it's like, it, it's always a bit unnerving how God acts sometimes. Because some of the things that he does leave you kind of, well, just kind of taking a deep gulp. I mean, like case in point, uh, in Numbers chapter 16, uh, there was a, a priest named Korah, and Korah didn't like Moses' leadership, so he wanted to get rid of Moses and set up his own leadership of the Israelites, so he's trying to subvert the leader of the pastor, as it were, so they have a huge meeting, and everybody's there, uh, and during the meeting, there's an earthquake where Korah was, and let's just pretend this whole section is Korah's people right here. Well, okay, we'll pick these people, Okay. <laughs> We'll say, this is Korah. I did this in the last service, and one of the guys actually moved sections. I mean, <laughs> let's just say, this is Korah's section, and they're trying to overthrow the pastoral leadership. They want a new pastor in there, etc. cetera. So there's a, there's a, during the meeting of who's the leader, there's a localized earthquake only where they are. And I've been in earthquakes in California. I know what they're like, the rumble, the sound, ground starts shaking, and then all of a sudden, the ground starts opening up, and all of these chairs disappear into the chasm. And then it closes. Imagine that kind of church business meeting. <laughs> you imagine? God's like, I'm tired of those kind of meetings. I'm just, I'm removing Korah. Have you read that in the Old Testament? Doesn't it make you kind of go, ooh. Yeah, how about Moses' wife who challenges his leadership and what happened to her? Uh, this is, this is uh, Numbers chapter 12. What happens to her? The wife steps forward and says, honey, I really don't think you got it going on as a leader. No, leprosy. I mean, it's all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, wow. Uh, Numbers chapter 21. Uh, the Israelites went off the rails. God sent fiery serpents to bite them. Oh, my. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22. God uh, uh, removes the high priest Eli because he fails to govern his two godless, carnal, loving sons. And so God disciplines Eli, takes him out because he will not discipline his, his grown sons. Uh, first uh, Samuel chapter 12, David commits multiple sins, starting with Bathsheba, and as he does that, eventually God judges his life. Even though he's forgiven, he still has to pay penalties for what he's done. And you're like, wow, God, whoa, heavy duty. You know what? It's the same God of the New Testament. It's just we live in the period of grace where he calls out to all sinners, come unto me, 
Oh, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's grace, but it's the same God of wrath who one day moves in wrath. And you either are covered by him when the flames come, as it were, or you're not. Last thing I want to talk about in closing is the direction of God's wrath. Like, who's he directed toward? Well, he tells you who he directs it toward. He directs his wrath. He says, it is revealed from heaven against who? All ungodliness and, and the word all is, is, uh, is uh, left out by ellipsis, but it's, it's to be repeated. But it, it, his wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the righteousness of men. This is very interesting. Uh, why those two words? Well, the first word, uh, ungodliness, means, uh, well, this is the word for like rebellion, uh, to be disloyal. When you said you were going to be loyal and you're totally disloyal. Uh, this word asavia was used in the Greek uh, culture as they worshiped their pantheon of gods. If you were loyal to the gods, you were called eusavion. If you were disloyal to the gods, you were called asavion. Because the alpha, uh, letter alpha affixed to a word negates its meaning. So if you took that word, uh, letter alpha, and affixed it to the word for loyalty, it meant you were disloyal. So Paul comes along and says, I, I get the Greek culture. But I'm going to apply it to the living God. You are either loyal to him or you're disloyal to him. And Paul says, God's wrath is revealed against all those who are disloyal to everything God says is the right way to go. Rebellion is what it's about. Is that not the culture you live in? God says this way. The culture says, oh, no, it's this way. And we're going to make it even look like it's not sinful anymore. God says, no, that's sinful. That's, that's rebellion. The other word he says there is his wrath revealed against all unrighteousness of men. Uh, the other one was asavion, unrighteousness, uh, or, or uh, uh, ungodliness, asavion. Ungodliness is adakion. They sound very similar, to totally different words. Asavion means to disregard that which is right, outright disregard it. Liz and I, we bought our first home. Uh, behind our home was a massive lot that had been there forever. Uh, and they eventually built a Home Depot there. Hallelujah. It was awesome. I could walk there and get a, anything I wanted in like two minutes. One night we were sitting there on a Friday night when they just opened it. We're sitting there. I'm like, hey, you want to go on a date? She's like, awesome. And I said, you want to walk over to the tool corral? And Are you serious? Not a date. She's still with me. Um, but before they built that Home Depot, as they prepared to build it, and it was a clean lot. It was a totally clean lot. Nothing on it. They put in one sign, four by four post, sunk it into the ground right by my house, put a post in there, put a sign on it. Here's what the sign said. <laughs> no dumping. One sign. Guess what happened? <laughs> yeah. Once it said, don't do this, somebody got a pickup truck full of garbage and, it, and they backed it up to the sign and dumped it and covered the sign. <laughs> I thought to myself, Adikion. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, that means you totally disregard what the law said. Is that not your culture? The Constitution says this, but politicians say the opposite. The law says this. Well, we pick and choose what we want to do. All the way down to the youngest person who says, well, my dad told me to do this, but I'm doing this. And I'm just not going to tell them. They'll never know. I mean, that rebellion is everywhere. It's not doing that which is right. The law says do this, and you choose in your own free will. I'm going to do the opposite of that, which is why this particular word is the word to twist something, to bend something that was formerly righteous. I'm going to twist it, and I'm going to call it holy. That's my culture. I was uh, thinking of illustrations in my culture to validate both, both points, but I don't think I need to because we all know illustrations of both those points. What's the solution for sinners who are wrapped up in those things? Christ. He's the answer. Because when a person comes to him in faith, his wrath goes by them. Uh, years ago, uh, Dr. Uh, Darnell Barnhouse uh, uh, preached through Romans, and he told this story that I have to tell you again because it's, it's just too appropriate. And it's about this entire concept of the wrath of God. There was an atheist uh, man, skeptical of faith, didn't like Christians, uh, he lived in a farming community, and the, the church happened to be surrounded by all of his land that he farmed. And so all the other farmers were Christians, but he was not a Christian. He was a devout skeptic. 
And so he decided uh, that while all the farmers uh, went to church on Sunday and didn't touch their fields, that's when he was going to plow everything around the church constantly. So they met for church. That's what he did. He fired up all of his tractors, dist, plowed, all he did. When it came time for harvest around October, he fired up the big combines all during the church service. He did it on purpose. And that year, he had the biggest crop he had ever had. So he wrote the local newspaper. And this is what he wrote. Dear editor, I have a question for the Christian community and the Christian farmers. Why is it that my crops produce the highest yield and I did not go to church on Sunday and theirs did not match my yield and they're in church every Sunday? I would like to know as a skeptic. Interesting question, isn't it? The editor was a Christian and the editor wrote him back and said this. <laughs> this is just amazing. It says, dear farmer, you must please realize that God does not settle his accounts in October. <laughs> in case you're drifting and you weren't listening to me, what did he say? Dear farmer, God does not settle his accounts in October. What's the implication? But he does settle his accounts. Do not deceive yourself. If you're that guy deceiving yourself, realize God settles accounts one day. You've either confessed him as Lord and you're in that protective tent of his covering, or you're not. I know where I'm at. Uh, I want you to be there too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you've done in sending your son to be our savior. Uh, and might some of the, the texts that we've looked at, the stories we've told, the illustrations we've given, uh, be used to motivate us as saints to share the power and the wonder and the truth of the gospel, uh, the hard news of it and the great news of it to those around us. And we pray for those in our body that don't know you. Might you draw them to yourself redeem them and save them as only you can do in a powerful, uh, spectacular way. And we praise you for who you are in Christ's name, amen.